Hi, I'm Mary Claire Spector from the Bartholomew County Public Library and welcome to tonight's event, To Be Hoosiers. Before we begin, I want to recognize Stephanie Merrifield and our digital underground, who's handling the technical aspects for us. If you have questions during the event, please type them in the comments section and we will relay those to Ray. Our presenter is Ray E. Boomhauer, and he is the senior editor of the Indiana Historical Society Press and editor of the quarterly history magazine, Traces of Indiana and Midwestern History. Ray graduated from IU in 1982 with degrees in journalism and political science. He received his master's degree in US history from IU Indianapolis. And before joining the society staff, Ray worked in public relations for the State Museum and as a reporter for two Indiana daily newspapers. Along with numerous articles for Traces and other periodicals, Ray is the author of a ton of books, including Destination Indiana, Travels Through Hoosier History, Gus Grissom, The Lost Astronaut, and Fighting for Equality, A Life of May Wright Sewell, and The Soldier's Friend, A Life of Ernie Pyle. And Ray was last with us this past summer and talked about Ernie Pyle, and that was a great program. Tonight, Thank he you. chats with us about his latest book, To Be Hoosiers, Historic Stories of Character and Fortitude. Over to you, Ray. Mary Clara, thank you. And thank you to the library for inviting me to speak tonight. I'm gonna to try to uh, share my screen here. And start from the beginning. Um, my book to be Hoosiers Historic Stories of Character and Fortitude is really a distillation of my work in Indiana history for more than 30 years now. I've been lucky enough to write a number of stories for uh, Traces Magazine over the years, focusing on a lot of individuals and events from the Hoosier State's past. And there are 21 of them collected uh, in this book. Uh, tonight, I'm going to talk a little bit about Hoosiers and, and what it means, uh, perhaps not really answering that question uh, fully, uh, but it will get you thinking about what it means to be a Hoosier. And I'm going to concentrate on uh, two stories from my book. Uh, we could not have any of Sanders' reindeer. Uh, they're not Hoosiers, but we are gonna have two individuals from Indiana who, um, well, one not from Indiana, but one from Indiana uh, who are, were involved in flight. Uh, one, Amelia Earhart and her time at Purdue University and the second person I'll be talking about is uh, Gus Grissom. But first, a little bit about the word Hoosier. On January 1st, 1833, just 17 years after Indiana had become the 19th state in the Union, the Indianapolis Journal printed in its carrier's address as a New Year's greeting to its uh, readers, a poem by this gentleman, John Finley of Richmond, Indiana. Now his poem, The Hoosier's Nest, which praised the state and proclaimed that countless men of every UN fashion were flocking to the Hoosier nation, received instant acclaim and was reprinted in numerous newspapers throughout the country and even internationally. Now, since that first appearance in the journal, uh, the term Hoosier has become one of America's most recognizable state nicknames, along with Buckeyes for those from Ohio, Badgers from people from Wisconsin, Wolverines from Michigan, and Tar Heels for residents of North Carolina. Now, throughout its history, Indiana has been seen by many, noted Indiana historian and journalist John Bartlow Martin, as a bucolic place inhabited by pleasant, simple, neighborly folk. It was a state where a radical thinker like uh, Eugene Debs on the right here, the Hoosier Union organizer, writer, lecturer, and fine time five-time presidential candidate on the Socialist Party ticket, could maintain close relationships with some of the richest men in his hometown of Terre Haute, as well as uh, with a man considered as the prototypical Hoosier, uh, the Hoosier poet himself, James Whitman Riley. Now this Indiana ideal, as Martin called it, contains a good deal of myth and also masks from view the less desirable aspects sometimes of the Hoosier character including a time in the 1920s when the Ku Klux Klan, a supremacist organization under D.C. Stevenson, controlled state government. Although the Indiana idea has undergone a metamorphosis 
as rural and agricultural has been supplanted by urban and industrial, those ideas still have a powerful hold on the way in which Hoosiers view their past. Like any myth, Barton said, it has some truth in it. Now, one question about the state has always seemed to linger in the back of the minds of visitors, and it's something I'm always asked when I travel out of state, you know, what is a Hoosier? Since Finley's poem popularized the term, speculation about the origin of Hoosier has run rampant. The late Indiana historian Jacob Pyatt Dunn Jr. conducted lengthy research into the history of the word, and he found that Hoosier was used frequently in the South in the 19th century to refer to woodsmen or rough hill people. He even traced the word all the way back to Hooser, H-O-O-Z-E-R, a term from the Cumberland dialect of England. Now, Hooser is from the Anglo-Saxon word who, meaning high or hill. And in the Cumberland dialect, he found that the word Hooser meant anything unusually large, like a hill. Uh, descendants of English immigrants brought the name with them when they settled in the hill country of Southern Indiana. Now, other theories abound as to the uh, origin of Hoosier, uh, some whimsical uh, and some not. Uh, apparently when a Hoosier knocked, when a visitor knocked on the door of a pioneer cabin in Indiana, the settler inside would respond, who's year? Uh, this greeting marked Indiana as the Hoosier or Hoosier state. Uh, Indiana laborers along the Ohio River were so successful in trouncing or hushing their opponents in fights that they became known as hushers, eventually Hoosiers. There's a story that there once existed a contractor named Hoosier working on the Louisville and Portland Canal who hired most of his laborers from Indiana and thereafter they were known as Hoosier's men. Riley himself claimed that the state's early settlers were such enthusiastic and vicious fighters that during scuffles, they would do anything to win, including biting off noses and ears. A settler coming into a tavern the morning after a fight would encounter missing appendages on the ground, hold them up and ask whose ear. Indiana author and diplomat uh, Meredith Nicholson had the, I think perhaps the best response when he was asked what a Hoosier was. He said that the origin of the term Hoosier is not known with certainty, but it is certain that Hoosiers everywhere bear their nickname uh, proudly. You can see this from uh, the meaning of the word Hoosier in that it has stirred not only scholarly debate, but controversy in 1987 the office of then U.S. Senator Dan Quayle uh, engaged in a battle with Webster's Third International Dictionary about just what a Hoosier was. In its alternative meanings for Hoosier, uh, Webster's defined the noun form as an awkward, unhandy, or unskilled person, especially an ignorant rustic. Uh, the verb form the dictionary added meant to loaf on or botch a job. Not very uh, an accurate term, I don't think. New York Senator Alphonse D'Amato even used the dictionary's um complementary definition to predict defeat for Indiana University in its battle for the NCAA basketball championship against Syracuse University that year. I'm happy to note that, of course, IU guard Keith Smart's timely last second shot won the game for the Hoosiers. Wales press secretary Peter Lincoln struck back at the dictionary by threatening to remove it from the senator's office unless the company changed its definition for Hoosier. Lincoln also invented his own new word, Webster, whose form he said meant to misdefine the word stubbornly and outrageously. Uh, the people of Marion Webster, he said, are guilty of Webstering. The search for the meaning of the word Hoosier continues in 1995, William Pearson, a Fisk University professor of history, in an article for the Indiana Magazine of History, theorized that the term Hoosier came from an itinerant African-American minister named Harry Hoosier, a former slave called by one Methodist clergyman as one of the best preachers in the world. Accepting this theory, Pearson wrote, would offer Indiana a plausible and worthy first Hoosier, black Harry Hoosier, the greatest preacher of his day, a man who rejected slavery and stood up for morality and the common man. 
Now, the final answer to what is a Hoosier may never be answered, but there are at least ways to understand the character of those from the state by examining, as I do in this collection, events and people from the past. And we can even examine uh, people who are not Hoosiers themselves, but came to Indiana and were drawn here uh, to make a difference in the state and in doing so also made a difference in this country and internationally as well. And the first uh, person from the book I'm going to talk about uh, involves a uh, groundbreaking pilot in Purdue University. Now in his 23 years as Purdue's president, Dr. Edward Charles Elliott made many changes to the campus in West Lafayette making it one of the country's leading technical and engineering institutions. And as this leader, Elliot operated on what he called a doctrine of chance. He noted that chance meetings, unexpected conversations, all play a more important part of an individual's life than do most planned and carefully executed experience. Now, one of these chance meetings that Elliot described resulted in a major coup for Purdue when, in June 1935, he announced the appointment of a visiting faculty member as a career counselor for the school's female students. The new addition to the staff had already achieved worldwide fame, what would pass into legend following her stint at the Hoosier School. Purdue had been able to land Amelia Earhart, seen here with Dr. Elliott. Although she spent only a short time at Purdue, both she and the university benefited from their relationship, along with the mountains of publicity garnered from her presence on the faculty. Purdue also became the beneficiary of Earhart's person-to-person -person talents as she encouraged female students to embark on careers that were normally reserved for men. And in Earhart's case, her husband, George P. Putman, Vince Elliott and the university to help fund a flying laboratory for his wife's use. Through the Purdue University Research Foundation and donations from Hoosier businessmen and others, the university in April 1936 established an Amelia Earhart Fund for Aeronautical Research that aided her in purchasing a, a twin motored Lockheed Electra airplane. Here you see Amelia. Uh, posing on top with some uh, Purdue University female students uh, posing with her in front of the aircraft. And this is the plane she used on her ill-fated round-the-world flight from which she vanished in July 1937. Because of her busy schedule, Earhart could not be a full-time faculty member at Purdue, but did uh, attempt to spend at least a month at the university during the school year as that career consultant for women. Uh, for her efforts, she received a $2,000 salary from Purdue. And along with guiding women students toward new careers, she also served as a technical advisor in aeronautics to Purdue, which was at that time the only university in the country equipped with its own airport. Now, Earhart arrived at West Lafayette at the campus to assume her duties on November 6, 1935. The local newspaper heralded the famous flyer's arrival with a page one headline declaring, Amelia Earhart leaves air to guide Purdue girls in careers. With Earhart scheduled to be at the university only three weeks, the newspaper noted that she would have little opportunity for leisure during her uh, time on campus. That prediction came uh, to pass in her first few days at Purdue. Earhart attended a luncheon for the home economics department, served as a guest of honor at a mortar board luncheon, met the student body at an afternoon tea in the Memorial Union building, and spoke at a special convocation at the Memorial Gymnasium. She was given a workspace in the Dean of Women's office uh, and uh, lived in South Hall and became a very familiar site on campus. Students flocked to her side, especially at dinner time and uh, tried not only to imitate her style of dress, which was a uh, casual, as you can see, to say the least, but her mannerisms as well. 
Helen uh, Shellam, in charge of the dormitory where Earhart stayed, said there were days when table manners were considered somewhat important. And Amelia's posture at table when she was deep in conversation was apt to be sitting forward on the edge of her chair uh, with both of her elbows on the table and chin cupped in her hands. Naturally, the question was, if Miss Earhart can do it, uh, why can't we? And her stock reply was, as soon as you can fly the Atlantic, you can do what Amelia does. Earhart uh, managed to fit in well with dormitory and student life at Purdue. Marion Frazier, who lived in the same dorm as she did, remembered that it seemed as though Earhart was always terribly busy, noting that she heard Earhart working away at her typewriter as late as midnight on many nights. She also recalled studying one night when Earhart suddenly appeared into her room and asked to borrow a pen for a short time. The excited Frazier could not keep the news to herself, so when her celebrity neighbor returned to borrow a pen, she was greeted by a room full of co-eds, all wanting to catch a glimpse of the celebrated pilot. To fulfill her duties as a career counselor, Earhart prepared a questionnaire seeking answers from students about such issues as why they were in college, if they wanted a career, how marriage might affect their choices, and what part a husband might play in their life and their plans. Of those responding to Earhart's questionnaire, she found that approximately 92% of the female students indicated that they did want to pursue a career after graduating. And according to Earhart's husband, Putnam, his wife wanted to find out about the students' after college plans to help university officials in reconstructing courses so they might be more beneficial to them in the future. As I said, she only spent a short time at the university, but Earhart's, Earhart's ties to Purdue played a key role in securing for her the money and equipment she needed for attempting what would become her final flight. Thanks to donations to the Earhart Fund established by Purdue and contributions in equipment from a variety of countries, including Goodyear, Goodrich, and Western Electric, uh, she was able to purchase the 10 passenger Lockheed Electra aircraft that she's standing in front of this photograph. The plane that was built in Burbank, California, included such special features as extra gasoline tanks for extended flight and automatic pilot and a uh, two-way radio. On June 1st, 1937, Earhart and her navigator here, Fred Noonan, took off from Miami, Florida in the Electra on the first leg of their plan around the world flight. Uh, the trip proceeded smoothly until the dif difficult 2,500 mile flight from Ley, New Guinea to Howland Island. Uh, the two never reached that destination, and despite a massive search, uh, no trace could be found of the plane and its crew. Two weeks after Earhart disappeared, Elliot telegraphed uh, Putnam uh, with the following message. George, she would not want us to grieve uh, or weep. She would have become a heroine uh, in any age. Moving on from Earhart and her significant contributions to uh, aviation, uh, I'm going to switch to another character in my book uh, to be Hoosiers. This one from Indiana, uh, who made a significant contribution to the American space program. And if things had gone, had not gone horribly wrong, on uh, January 27th, 1967, might have been the first man to walk on the moon instead of Neil Armstrong. Uh, I'm talking about uh, Hoosier astronaut Gus Grissom. Now, early in the morning on July 21st, 1961, a Redstone rocket blasted off from a launch pad at Cape Canaveral in Florida. Uh, at the top of the rocket, in the tiny Mercury spacecraft, sat a Purdue University graduate who had won his wings as a pilot with the U.S. Air Force, had uh, flown approximately 100 combat missions during the Korean War, and had been one of seven men selected by uh, NASA to become the country's first astronauts. 
Uh, Gus Grissom set Pose to become only the third man and the second American to journey into space. Uh, that short trip uh, proved to be quite an eventful one for Gus. Uh, Grissom was born and raised in Mitchell, Indiana, uh, just uh, located down Indiana 37, south of uh, Bloomington and Bedford. He was the son of a railroad signal man and it turned to flying as his career after receiving a degree in mechanical engineering from Purdue. After his uh, distinguished service in Korea, he'd returned to the United States and become a test pilot at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base outside of Dayton, Indiana. Now he was still there testing uh, advanced aircraft like the F-104 Star Starfighter when on October 4th, 1957, Soviet Union shocked the world by announcing it launched the first satellite, Sputnik, into space. Uh, this small ball uh, could be heard by American tracking stations as a circle of the globe, uh, making its beep beep sound and inaugurating uh, the space race. Uh, it's a little hard, I think, for uh, the younger generation today to realize what a shock this was to the American public. Uh, we had been led to believe that uh, American techno technology was superior, uh, that the Soviet Union, the communists couldn't even build a decent tractor. You know, how could they beat such an advanced uh, country as ourselves into space? So it was uh, quite a shock to the American psyche uh, there was a re-dedication to uh, science education and a, a quick program uh, to try to catch up uh, with the Soviet Union. And after a few false starts, uh, our early rockets had the disconcerting habit of blowing up on the launch pad. Uh, we did manage to put the first U.S. satellite, Explorer 1, into orbit about four months after Sputnik had, uh, had its success. With the public and politicians clamoring for action, the U.S. in 1958 initiated the first man in space program, Project Mercury. Now, President Eisenhower decided that the astronauts for the space program would come from the ranks of uh, military service test pilots. And the National Aeronautics and Space Administration asked the various services to list their members who met specific qualification. There were about 500 candidates who qualified and 110 of them survived the initial screening process. One of them who was called to Washington DC at the beginning of February, 1959 to be evaluated as a possible astronaut was Grissom who uh, had received these top secret orders from the adjutant at his base at Wright-Patterson who was quite perplexed by these uh, secret orders saying to Gus, you know, what kind of hell have you been raising lately? Uh, a confused Grissom expressed puzzlement about uh, the question and learned that he had been uh, given orders to go to Washington dressed in civilian and not in military attire to keep the secrecy intact. Now, before he left home, his wife, Betty, uh, thinking of the wildest possibility imaginable, asked him, what are they going to do? Shoot you up in the nose cone of an Atlas rocket? Well, Betty was uh, almost a Cassandra. She knew what was going to happen. She had hit the nail on the head. Uh, Gus reported to the nation's capital and thought like he had wandered right into the middle of a James Bond novel. He was ushered into a large reception room filled with men who were, he discovered after a short time talking with them, uh, test pilots like himself. Now, out of this group of 110 men, uh, 39, Grissom included, were sent to the Lovelace Clinic in Albuquerque, New Mexico to be probed and prodded by scientists. And out of this torturous process, NASA picked seven men to serve as the Project Mercury astronauts and presented them to the public at a press conference in April, 1959. You have in the back row there, Al, from left to right, Alan Shepard, uh, Wally Sherrar, John Glenn. And in the front row from left to right there, there's Gus, uh, Scott Carpenter, 
uh, Donald K. Deke Slayton, and uh, Gordo Cooper, who was a, a good friend of Gus's and also was a Wright Patterson with him. Now, Gus had almost missed out on this historic designation uh, as one of the first men in space when doctors, through their wide ranging tests, discovered that he was suffered from hay fever and was allergic. And uh, Gus was uh, quick thinking. He said, you know, there won't be any ragweed pollen in space and uh, saved him from being dropped from the program. With this out of the way, Grissom and his fellow astronauts underwent training to see which one on NASA was confident to be the first man in space. Now, except for John Glenn, who had some experience in dealing with the media, the other astronauts, particularly Gus, were not very comfortable dealing with the uh, crush of media attention. And at that first press conference, uh, the uh, astronauts had been asked, you know, what was the worst part of the process? And a lot of them said that the uh, often invasive medical testing done at the Lovelace Clinic was the worst part, but not to Gus. He said this, you know, the crush of media, all this attention, uh, this was the worst part for them. Uh, the media scrutiny uh, grew only worse as uh, time went on. And on January 19th, 1961, Bob Gilrath, who was the head of Project Mercury, confidentially informed the original seven astronauts uh, who would be going first. The flight order would have Shepard to being the first man to ride the Redstone rocket. Shepard at the right there in his astronaut outfit. Grissom had uh, the second flight and John Glenn would be back up for both missions. Now all this careful planning didn't work out the way NASA had hoped because on April 12, 1961, uh, the Russians shocked the world again when the Soviet Union announced that Yuri Gagarin had made a one orbit flight around the Earth that lasted 108 minutes in his Vostok spacecraft Swallow, winning for the Soviet Union the honor of being the first nation to put a human being into space. Shepard did follow Gagarin uh, into space with his suborbital flight on Freedom 7 on May 5, 1961. And had a very successful mission, returned to Earth safely. On the morning of his scheduled flight aboard his uh, Mercury spacecraft, designated as Liberty Bell 7, uh, named after the uh, Liberty Bell in Philadelphia because of its uh, bell-like shape, uh, you can see on the spacecraft at the lower left, to the left of the Liberty Bell 7 name, uh, a white line there. And that's a simulated crack that technicians had painted on the spacecraft to uh, simulate the crack in the Liberty Bell. And after all the problems that went on with this flight, as I'll talk about in a bit, um, technicians vowed to never do such paint any kind of crack on any of the spacecraft in subsequent flights. Grissom appeared calm and collected as he was helped in the, to the spacecraft by his backup, John Glenn there uh, to the right. And during the last minute physical, the doctor examining Grissom had been surprised at his subject's low blood pressure. His 15 minute, 37 second flight went off without a hitch as his capsule made a successful splashdown in the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, from that point on, however, uh, everything that could go wrong uh, did go wrong for, for Gus. As he was waited uh, to be picked up by a Marine helicopter from the carrier USS Randolph, he informed the chopper pilots they would need about three or four minutes to check the switch positions on the instrument panel in the spacecraft. Uh, according to the recovery plan, uh, the helicopter pilot was supposed to radio the Grissom as soon as he's hooked on and it started lifting the capsule out of the water, as you see here in this photograph. At that point, Grissom would remove his helmet, blow off the hatch uh, with a special activator that would trigger the explosive bolts that, uh, holding on the hatch. And he would exit the spacecraft, uh, get into the water, the helicopter holding onto his spacecraft would lift it up, another chopper would come in and pick up Gus from the water. 
I had unhooked the oxygen inlet hose by now and was lying flat on my back, minding my own business, Gus later recalled, when suddenly the hatch blew off uh, with a dull thud. All I could see was blue ski, sky and seawater rushing in over the sill uh, of the open hatch. Tossing off his helmet, he hoisted himself through the hatch. And I never moved as fast in my life, said Grissom. Uh, the next thing I knew, I was floating high in my suit with water up to my armpits. Although the helicopter, as you can see, managed to hook on to this capsule, it could not handle the weight of the waterlogged spacecraft and had to cut it loose. And this was the first time in his long flying career that Grissom had ever lost uh, one of his uh, aircraft. On July 20th, 1999, uh, undersea explorer Kurt Newport raised the Liberty Bell 7 from its resting place on the ocean floor. And today that spacecraft, uh, fully restored, is now part of the collection at the Kansas Cosmosphere and Space Center in Hutchinson, Kansas. And it's a great place to visit if you happen to be in Kansas and nearby. I encourage you to stop by and uh, say hello to the Liberty Bell 7. Now, while the helicopter pilot, Jim Lewis, was struggling to save the Liberty Bell 7, uh, Grissom found himself struggling in the water, trying to keep from drowning. Uh, although his spacesuit kept out the water, he was losing buoyancy in it because of an open air inlet port uh, in the belly of the spacesuit. Uh, he said, I thought to myself, well, you've gone through this whole flight and now you're going to sink right here in front of all these people. Uh, Grissom, exhausted by now, was finally uh, picked up by a nearby helicopter. And once aboard, the uh, helicopter found the strength to grab a Mae West life jacket and put it on for the flight back to the Randolph. I wanted to make certain, he said, that if anything happened to this helicopter, I would now have to go through another Duncan. Once he was safely on board the Randolph, and one of the uh, crew's officers came up to him and handed him his space helmet, which they had been plunk, uh, found floating next to an escort destroyer, and told him, for your information, uh, we found it floating right next to a 10-foot shark. Now, although an astronaut accident review panel cleared Grissom, and the other astronauts always supported him. Uh, this questions about the hatch controversy dog, the Hoosier native for the rest of his career. In his book, The Right Stuff, Tom Wolfe, uh, and also in the movie, the same name based on the, that work, there seemed to be the insinuation that somehow Grissom, a veteran of combat missions in Korea, just while you know, floating safely in the ocean, panicked somehow, and uh, blew off the hatch ahead of schedule. Um, his fellow astronauts never believed that. And in fact, on a subsequent mission involving uh, Wally Sharar, uh, he, when he triggered the hatch mechanism, there was a kickback uh, from the mechanism uh, so severe that it actually penetrated his uh, glove that he wore from his spacesuit and gave him a nasty cut on his hand. And he showed this to his friend Gus and marked upon it. And Gus was very happy about this because he had no marks on him from his flight. And it's showing that he did not purposely blow the hatch ahead of time. And in fact, one of the best explanations for what happened came uh, from a NASA official. He said the problem was that Gus did too good of a job. He was ahead on the checklist. He was, you know, wanted to do um, get things right uh, on that checklist and had uh, kind of uh, gone too far ahead. There was a, a safety mechanism on the safety tr uh, safety on the mechanism that Gus would trigger to blow the hatch. And Gus was supposed to keep that on until the helicopter had hooked on to his capsule. Uh, but uh, he had removed that before the helicopter hooked on. And just without that safety in place, just the bobbing up and down of the capsule and the swell of the ocean would be enough to have that plunger mechanism trigger and blow off. 
Now, NASA must have agreed uh, with all these explanations because it tapped Grissom uh, and John Young to test out its next iteration of the American Space Program, the two-man uh, Gemini spacecraft, on its maiden voyage into space on a three-orbit mission on March 23, 1965. Uh, NASA also selected Grissom to command the first manned Apollo mission, uh, the spacecraft that would take astronauts to the moon, uh, trying to meet President John F. Kennedy's goal of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to Earth before the end of the decade. Deke Slayton, who had been grounded because of a medical issue and had uh, been dropped from space flights, but was uh, nabbed to uh, select flight crews for the various missions, privately told his friend Grissom that if all went well, Grissom himself would be first in line to command a lunar landing mission and actually have the opportunity, if at all possible, of being the first person to walk on the moon. Now, all did not go well. On Friday, January 27, 1967, Grissom and his crewmates, Roger Chaffee, a rookie and the youngest person ever selected to join the astronaut corps, and Ed White, the first American to do a spacewalk, uh, were involved in a simulated countdown of the three-man Apollo spacecraft at the uh, Kennedy Space Center's Pad 34. And at uh, one o'clock in the afternoon, uh, the uh, crew went into this command module built by Martha May American Aviation, and they never made it out alive. At 6.31 p.m., after a lot of holds and technical issues, flight controllers on the ground heard an astronaut, probably Chaffley, calmly announced, fire, I smell fire. Seconds later, Widemore urgently stated, uh, fire in the cockpit. Uh, the intense heat and smoke hampered rescue efforts, but pad workers finally were able to open the hatch. Uh, they were too late. The three astronauts were dead, killed not by the fire, but by the carbon monoxide that filled the cabin and it ended their spacesuits after flames had burned through their air hoses. It took NASA nearly a year after the astronaut, after the accident, uh, during which time the Apollo spacecraft underwent extensive modifications to launch another manned mission, Apollo 7, that was commanded by Gus's friend, uh, Sharar, and it made 163 orbits during its 11-day mission, and America was once again back on its way to the moon. Looking back on the Apollo 1 tragedy, from a perspective of many years, NASA flight engineer Chris Kraft noted that while it was unforgivable that we allowed that accident to happen, if it never occurred, uh, the United States would not have gotten to the moon when it did. We made a lot of changes to command and lunar modules as a result of that experience, Kraft said. I think we would have all kinds of trouble getting to the moon with all of the system problems we had. That terrible experience also brought a new resolve and a renewed commitment to get the job done. It was Grissom himself, however, who, who perhaps best summed up the feelings of the astronauts. Of course, many of them test pilots who were used to lo use, losing friends in the line of duty. He said, if we, want, if we die, we want people to accept it uh, and hope it will not delay the space program. The conquest of space is uh, worth the risk of human life. Um, we have time now to uh, answer any questions you might have uh, about the book uh, To Be Hoosiers uh, or other, other of my uh, projects as well. Uh, see if there are any in the chat. Mary Claire, do you have any? We don't have no any questions. Questions, okay. I, um, will, I will plug uh, some uh, program here at the uh, Indiana Historical Society. It's called uh, Who, uh, History Happy Hours. We have them 
uh, on Thursdays. Uh, they're virtual programs like the one uh, the Bar Bartholomew County Public Library is sponsoring this evening uh, with experts on various uh, subjects related to Indiana history uh, that uh, you can join in on, uh, learn a lot about Indiana history. And if you visit our website, indianahistory.org, uh, you can look at the upcoming schedule, uh, sign up for the programs, and uh, uh, learn a bit about the 19 states past. Do you know what the topic is for this week, Ray? I do not, but if you go to our website, uh, there's you a full schedule. <laughs> you find out. Yeah. yeah. Well, thanks Websites so much. are great for that, yes. Thanks for joining us. We really appreciate it. Learned a lot. And I like okay. to hear about, uh, I didn't know that Gus was at Wright-Patterson. I grew up in Dayton, so been to Wright-Pat lots of times. Uh, both he and uh, Gordo Cooper were there at one at the same time. So cool. it's uh, kind of cool that they had uh, two of the original seven astronauts at uh, Wright-Patterson, just yeah. you know, down the road from Indiana. Yeah, that's neat. Well, I also, well, uh, also, if we have time, a short plug that uh, when uh, the pandemic is over and we're allowed to travel again, I urge people to go down to uh, Spring Mill State Park in Mitchell, Indiana, and to visit the uh, Gerst Memorial there. Uh, you'll have an opportunity to see the Gemini 3 spacecraft that uh, Grissom took into space with uh, John Young, uh, the unsinkable Molly Brown, uh, and other uh, sites as well uh, in the city uh, that uh, his uh, Grissom's childhood home is open as a historic site. There's a special uh, statue uh, dedicated to Gus's uh, memory as well. Unfortunately, uh, you know, one of the reasons why I wrote about Gus and did a biography of him uh, was the fact that uh, as a kid, my dad took us, my brothers down to Spring Mill and I was very uh, moved and interested in the space program uh, by going to the Grissom Memorial. And at that time, you could actually touch the, the Molly Brown. Uh, unfortunately, today it's it's behind plexiglass, so you can't do that. Uh, I can say that uh, I'm one of the uh, few individuals who can uh, say that I've touched both uh, the uh, Molly Brown and the Liberty Bell Seven because I saw it when it was on display a number of years ago uh, at the Children's Museum. You weren't supposed to, but I did. So don't tell me. Right. When you answered the question, it's indianahistory.org to get the information for them. And Spring Mill is just a neat state park also. Now that That's you a great, great state park. Yes. <laughs> Love it over there. Yes. It's a lot of fun. Okay. Any more questions, anybody out there? No? Okay. Well, thanks again, Ray. And have a good Christmas. You too, Mary Claire. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Bye.